All right, everybody, Happy New Year. So I can't believe it's 2024 already. It felt like 2023 has really flashed by in a flash, right? So yeah, at the start of every year, you know, I always do a state of the collection video where I showcase which watches have survived uh, the previous year. So let's see which 12 watches have survived 2023 and have made it to 2024. Let's take a look at my watch collection. So I've amassed 12 watches. Uh, you can see it fills up this watch box very nicely. So yeah, this is my current watch collection. I can't wait to see how it will change for next year, but let me take you through them as of this year. Now, for this state of the collection video, I'll also be including the prices because there's been some of the feedback from my past year SOTC videos. So I'm going to ask, oh, what's the market value of the watches? What's the market value of the collection? So that's something that I will share with you guys as well. So let's start the most affordable uh, watch I have here. This is my Long Jeans Heritage 1945. So, you know, I've had this for quite some time now. I think it's a really lovely watch. Long Jeans, of course, is not, a, I would say, not really an entry-level brand like Tissot or Hamilton, but still more on the accessible side. And, you know, there have been a couple of great releases lately, but I really do still love this. Right? Obviously, you guys don't know what this is. You no, know, this is a reissue of a 1945 watch by Long Jeans that Ben Climber had. And I just fell in love with, you know, the copper dial of this watch. Yeah, very nice watch, very nice touch. I love it to bits. The current market value of this is about 1.5k. I'll pop out the Chrono 24 uh, screenshot here. So yeah, if you're looking for like affordable long jeans watch, I think this is a very nice one. Next up is this, my Chrono Toki. So I've done a full video on this. I'll link it up above. I had this for I think about two years now. I really fell in love, of course, with number one, this pinky salmon dial. It's quite unlike any other salmon dials that I have. It's unlike my salmon Rolex. So yeah, I really do like this sort of pinkish, like, almost like sashimi hue, which is great because it's obviously a Japanese brand, uh, the more accessible mass market brand by Hajime Asuoka. I really do like, you know, the case, the curvature of the case. On the wrist, it really pops. Unfortunately, you know, this is not one that, uh, again, is very high of value. I think the retail for this is about 2.7k Singapore dollars, I think as of now. I can't really find it on Chrono 24 for some reason, at least. The market value is not tracked, but on Cairo Zelm, they're trading about 20% below retail, so about 2.2k. But nevertheless, I no regrets buying it. I really think, you know, I really love this watch. It really pops on the wrist. In the same independent train, we have this, the Blue Ming 1709, uh, the last of the 17 uh, series. I've always been a fan of Ming, you know, I think Ming has a very striking and instantly recognizable aesthetic. Uh, you have the scatternized hands, you have the floating sort of minute track, you have the guilloche dial, you have the, of course, zero uh, at 12 o'clock, you have the flat lux. Very, very interesting watch. Actually, I've gotten quite a lot of compliments on this. So yeah, the market value for this is actually slightly above retail. I believe the retail that I paid for this was about 2.8, 2.9k Singapore dollars. As of now, according to Chrono24, it's about 20%, 25% above retail. It trades at around 3.7k. Slightly more, I wouldn't say very expensive, slightly more uh, expensive watches. We have here the two-door Black Bay Silver 58, 925 Sterling Silver, of course. I If you guys watched my last year SOTC, I, I think I had the two-door Black Bay 58 Blue. Unfortunately, you know, it's a bit too common for me, so I sold that off. Why I decided to buy this is it was number one. I still love the two-door brand. I still love the Black Bay. I just wanted something a little bit more uncommon, and this silver one definitely, you know, does the trick. You don't really see much of this available on sale on Carousel or on Chrono24. Or even on like other collectors' wrists, it's the only one without the bracelet. I actually like it. It's also one of the few with an open case back. So very nice touch. You can see here I paired it uh, with a solitaire strap that I just recently reviewed as well. If we're looking to pick one up, the current market value for this again according to the Chrono Twenty Four is about five point two k. So I think that's about twenty to thirty percent below retail. So yeah, it's quite a steal in my opinion. All right, next up is my Hermes uh, Asso Squillet. So you have this very lovely uh, smoke scatternized dial. You have the lovely trademark Hermes uh, whimsical numerals. You have, of course, the asymmetrical case. Yeah, very nice watch. As you can probably tell, I like watches that are a bit uncommon. And this is definitely one that you won't see much on many collectors' wrists. But I really do love it. You know, the case back. Let me just again show you guys the case back. The movement, even though it's technically not in-house, is very nicely finished. It's a Sadita movement actually, but scattered nice for a mess. Very nicely finished. And yeah, it just wears so nicely on the wrist. I just really like its aesthetic. The retail on this is slightly crazy. It's like 11 or 12k or something. Don't buy that. Uh, but as of now, it sits at slightly below half of retail. So actually quite a huge depreciation, unfortunately, for a mess watch. That's the case. 
currently has a market value according to Chrono24 of about 5.5k. I have it here on the uh, black Baturo leather strap from Solitaire Official. Okay, up next my Cartier Tank Jumbo, uh, reference number 15716, the New York edition. This is by far one of my favorite watches in my entire collection, one of my top three. Yeah, at least according to Chrono24, it's not very expensive. It's a market value of apparently about 5.7k. But I actually think for once that the Chrono24 pricing is slightly under like market pricing, you know. There's not many of these around, I think. Even on Chrono24, I think it's only about two or three. One recently sold at auction at Christie's for 5.8k USD. So that's like, I don't know, like 7k plus thing. So I think probably the, market, the true market value is somewhere around there, like high sixes, low sevens. But in any case, you know, watches is not about the market value anyway, right? As far as Cartier tanks goes, I think it's still not uh, it's still one of the more inexpensive one. And this is definitely one, again, even though I just said that that I think it will definitely appreciate the value because of I think how under the radar and how much of a hidden gem this is. And I really like the condition of mine, like it's really spotless, the dial has no tarnishing, uh, there's no cracks. It really is you know, a great size on the wrist as well. A great dress watch. In fact, if I'm looking for a dress watch, you know, if I'm in a suit and tie, this is the first one that I reach for. I just really like the Art Deco styling of it, like you really can't find anything quite like this uh, today and again it's so rare, I have yet to see another one of these in Singapore. So just as a quick nerd point, so it actually comes in sort of three different types, this is the New York Boutique Edition. The difference between the New York Boutique Edition and the London and Paris one is that here you have screws, it's a screw on case back, you have screws on case back and the crown is slightly elongated as well. You can see I have it here on the custom uh, Alligator or crocodile strap by Nomad Watch Works. There's my initials at the back, so very nice uh strap for a very nice watch. Okay, so now we move on to the upper row. The upper row watches are valued as slightly higher, so they're all above six thousand dollars. So we'll go next with the Tech Hoyer Monaco. So according to Chrono Twenty Four, this has a market value of about six point six or six point seven k, and I really do love this watch. I think I did a video on it as well. I'll link it up above. Of course, the Monaco, you know, is probably the most iconic Tech Hoyer model, uh, made famous by Steve McQueen, of course, in the movie Le Mans. But, you know, I didn't want the blue dial version that everybody has, right? When the, what some of you guys may not know is that when the Monaco was first released, it actually came in two dial variations. Of course, the popular blue dial, but also this grey dial. And, you know, this is actually a re-release from, I think, a decade ago. He has a really nice so metallic brush, a grayed out, it has a left hand crown, it has a vintage Hoyer logo, it has these red accents that really make it pop. Yeah, very automotive inspired watch obviously that I just love. I, because you guys can see here, all, of course with the exception of the tank, the rest of my watches are all round. So having a square watch is really something different, something very unique. And again, even amongst watch collectors, I don't really see this grayed out uh, variant often. So yeah, again, I really love having like a unusual uncommon piece that's again not very expensive in my collection some of you guys asked for this so i'll just show you guys a little bit of the case back here so again this is not the in-house movement but still you know i think it works fine and it's actually it's easier and cheaper to service as well so no complaints here i have it here on a horwin strap from shred artillery that i think the side stitching matches the monaco perfectly all right up next is my iwc portuguese chronograph again this has a market value of about 6.5k so the mid 6000s I had a few IWC chronographs before, but they were more on the pilot line. And you know, I just don't really vibe with the pilot line because I'm not much of a military person, I must say. Myself, you know, if you follow Waso Show, I'm definitely more of a suit, well, a suit like formal wear or smart casual at the very least person, right? So it was much of a no-brainer to really get the dressier version of the IWC chronograph, which is this, the Portuguese line. A very iconic uh, design that's remained unchanged for, I think, since it's been released, it's been virtually unchanged. This is a reference 3714. It's a very iconic uh, white dial gold indices. Yeah, I really do like this. It really is a classic. Now, technically speaking, I think this is more of the more common, quote unquote, common watches, unlike the Monaco, unlike the Cartier or this Speedmaster that I'll talk about later. This is more of the more common watches that I think you have no trouble finding. But that's what a classic is, right? You know, it's a classic for a reason. So yeah, I really do like this. I have no qualms of it being more slightly more common. I think that it just makes for like a great smart casual chronograph. I can wear this with a suit, I can wear this with a polo, no issues at all. And a big part of that is because of this sort of like light brown sh uh, strap that I paired with the watch. I think if you pair it with like a black strap, leather strap, 
will be much more dressy but because I pair it you know, with sort of this medium brown strap I think makes it you know much more casual and I actually quite like it like that so this strap if you watch my recent strap video is from Solitaire Official Alright up next my moon watch now the Omega Speedmaster really needs no introduction it's one of the most iconic watches ever created you know if you're a watch enthusiast and you don't have a moon watch you definitely should get one especially after you know the whole swatch and uh, moon swatch uh, craze I think I had this for three to four years now and the unique thing that I absolutely love about this watch is the brown dial and that's what makes it different from you know the majority of Speedmasters which features the black dial so according to Chrono 24 on the market this has a market value of about 7.5k yeah so you know it's still under retail I really do love this hot chocolate dial like it really makes like a tropical dial look and yeah again you know it's an iconic piece but with a slightly more uncommon configuration and I just absolutely love this watch okay next is actually my most recent purchase the JLC uh, Master Mimo Vox. So I really wanted a JLC for the longest time. I used to have a reversal, but because I got you know the Cartier tank, you know the reversal became sort of superfluous. So I got rid of that. I don't really need two rectangular watches in my collection. But ever since then, you know I really wanted another JJ Lukut. You know they call JLC the watchmaker watchmaker for a reason. JLC was the one that really provided the calibers for your top brands like your VC, your Patek Philippe, you know your Piguet. So I really wanted the JLC and I chanced upon this, the Mimo Vox. Now the Mimo Vox refers to sort of like having an alarm. So later, I think I'll show you guys how the alarm sounds like. It really sounds like a screw bell, very nice touch. And even though, you know, of course there are a few alarm watches in the market, like the Balkan Cricket for example, the Mimo Vox is by far best done by JLC. And it's a complication that they've had for literally decades now. And yeah, but despite that, you know, I think the Mimo Vox is again a line that flies underneath the radar. In fact, they only have one SKU or one model of this currently in a modern catalogue with this exact same sewer dial but I really do like it at first I had a bit of reservations buying this watch because I thought it might look a little bit plain you know, in, in photos but up close you can see, I hope the camera can capture this but you can see that it actually has a two-tone sewer dial you have the outer sort of dial there's a brush and you have this sort of like metallic sunburst silver uh, in the middle so this two-tone silver dial really does make it pop but in a subtle manner I really love the applied in this as well you can see how mirror polished they are everything the proportions just looks great it's a great dress watch but again just like the IWC I think if I swap out the shirt one the black leather shirt on this it can easily become a smart casual watch now let me show you guys how the alarm sounds like there you go Right, that's a lovely mechanical charm that I really fell in love, you know, upon first ring. Really nothing quite like anything else on the market. You know, one of my dream complications is always a mini repeater, but of course those cost like the six figures. So a Mimo Vox is really sort of my compromise. But yeah, really love the alarm. And again, this is really not very expensive as, as well, despite it being like a JLC watch, an Atas watch should say, you know, the Current retail on this, I think it's about like 20k for a new piece. This one is only a Chrono 24 at about 7.7k. So yeah, very good steal. Okay, for my penultimate uh, watch, this is the Grand Seiko Heritage Shunbun, you know, SBGA413. Really, you know, love this watch. This is like easily my top three watches in my collection. Never would sell this. Like the DAO obviously is supposed to mimic like the Sakura flowers of Japan. I think that's so really well. I really, 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 really love this pink Sakura dial. And of course, I love the spring drive movement as well. Not only is it a technical marvel, but look at that. Aesthetically speaking, I love this like sweep, smooth sweeping uh, seconds hand. And of course, of all these polished indices, the polished like mirror, polished uh, hands, they're polished of higher standards. Like easily, I think this Grand Seiko is probably the best finished watch in my entire collection very very nice underrated watch and of course the case itself is titanium so again very durable and hypoallergenic and you know very lightweight on the wrist i absolutely love this watch i think you know it can be a dress watch due to how polished you know the dial is how striking you know the faceted edges are but it can easily because of the titanium construction be like a sports watch as well like i don't think i actually bash this up so yeah one of my favorite watches in my collection Currently, it actually trades slightly below retail. 
the market price on this is about 7.8k so you know i think the, it's about like 20 percent below retail so if you want to grab this i think you can still do it at a nice discount all right last but definitely not least it's my relax date just reference 16234 being a watch enthusiast of course uh, a rolex is a must to own and i've thought about owning you know like several rolex over the years but i've always came back to this um my first memory of seeing like a rolex watch is actually a date just now, I used to be a tennis fan growing up and if you watch like Wimbledon and things like that, it's always that Rolex like time counter in the background and it always has a footed bezel. So I always also stood the footed bezel with Rolex and vice versa. So I knew if I had to own a Rolex, it has to be one with a footed bezel and of course only a date just offers that. And out of all the modern date just, you know, I don't really have one that I like because they're also common, right? The white dial, the blue dial, the black dial, everybody has them. I've really fell in love with this Sunburst uh, Summon Dial, which they don't produce anymore. So this is actually like a neo-vintage watch. I think it was produced in the late 90s. So I had this recently serviced by the Access. Shout out to them. Again, I'll link the video about them up in the description above. But yeah, right now it's as good as new, despite it being like 30 years old. And even though it's 36mm, uh, because of the long, look at how long the lugs are. Because the long lugs is actually very small, like a 38, which is fine by me. Just like, you know, the Shunbun, I think this is one that can definitely be a dress watch, you know, it's definitely a date just definitely a very dressy watch. You can wear it with a suit and of course this Jubilee bracelet, no issues. But of course you can wear it as like a sports watch as well, casual with a polo, even a t-shirt, no issues as well. I love how versatile this watch is. And despite it being a Rolex, it still really flies underneath the radar because it's not too big. It's not like a Submariner, it's not a Daytona, you know, it's still classy, it's still elegant, it really flies underneath the radar. But yeah, it's... Despite it being a date just, it's one of the rarer date just I've seen in the market. I don't even when you go on Carousel, you go on Chrono Twenty Four, you don't really see many of these uh summon dials because, like I said, they're longer produced. So on Chrono Twenty Four, this actually has a market price of nine point one k. So yeah, it's actually I think still slightly under retail. So if you want to grab one for yourself, it's still a pretty nice discount. And despite it being neo vintage, the one six two three four really has all the hallmarks of a modern Rolex. Yeah, it's a caliber three one three five. You know. 4 hertz movement, yes, a quick set date, you have sapphire crystal. So yeah, very, very modern in a sense, Rolex. Okay, so all in all, you know, my watch collection probably has a value of about 60k. On Chrono24, it says anywhere from 60k to 80k. But I'll take like the lower estimate because we all know that Chrono24 prices are slightly inflated due to the platform commissions. So yeah, the 60k watch collection, I'm proud to have amassed, you know, these 12 watches thus far. I'm not going to say that it's an affordable collection or entry-level collection, like on average 5k for a watch is still <laughs> quite a lot of money. But you know, easily I think my entire watch collection could be worth less than one person's like Royal Oak or Nautilus. So yeah, I think it's a pretty good like, okay, I'm probably going to get flamed for this, but it's truly how I feel. I think it's a pretty good middle class collection. A few nice pieces, nothing too outrageous. I mean, none of these watches here have a market value of like, five figures anyway so i think it's still pretty accessible collection but i really like that despite its accessibility like i think that i still have quite a few pieces that are quite uncommon that you, even if you had the money i think it'd be hard to find like the cartier for example or the glc memo box or the gray dial uh, monaco all right so that rounds up my sotc i would love to see what new pieces i add in 2024 i don't think i'll go like more than 12 i think i'll try to keep within the confines of this watch box so I'm, I'm interested to see like what I let go as well. But yeah, some of my wish list, I think, I think I only have two really. I really want the Octo Finissimo. I think that's something I'm looking at. If I can get it for like four figures, I think I'll, I'll go for it. And I'm potentially looking at a Breitling as well. Specifically a Breitling Premier uh, B0142 mm again in a Salmon Dial, maybe even a Blue Dial. But as of now, this is my watch collection. Let me know what you think of my watch collection. Or are there any pieces that you don't like? Are there any pieces that I should add? Are there any pieces that you love? I hope this is a slightly different SOTC from what you may see online where people just flaunt their Royal Oaks and their Daytonas and their Submariners and their Richard Mills and their Patek Philips. Yada, 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 yada. So yeah, I really do have a personal connection with each of and every one of these watches. There's a reason why I bought each and every one of them. Let's see how it goes for 2024. Let me know what you think and I'll see you guys in the new year. Ciao.